This week's blog post is the 12th in my series on a visit to the Wilkesworth Athenaeum. It includes a number of 17th and 18th century American artworks at the Wadsworth. The bust of Samuel Colt that I used in last week's post reminded me that I often find the neoclassical style intolerably calm and sedate. Why did such a rambunctious people as the Americans adopt neoclassicism? The answer is that when Americans became wealthy enough to pay well-trained artists, those artists were trained in Europe. They very frequently continued to work in the style in which they were trained. In Europe during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, that meant neoclassicism. For more on the story behind neoclassicism, see my Seismic Shifts in Subject and Style, 19th Century French Painting and Philosophy, which is available on Amazon. In this post, we're going to do a short survey of American art of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries by some artists who had training and some who did not. Spoiler, there is not a continuous progression from less well-executed to more technically proficient art. Not all artists spent years training and not all purchasers could afford top-of-the-line artists. Just as today there's a market for genuine Gucci and for Gucci knockoffs, so in the early days of the United States, and even today, there's a market for extremely high-quality artworks, as well as more affordable but less accomplished ones. First one that we'll look at is this portrait of Elizabeth Eggington. This portrait of a young girl is one of the earliest American paintings that can be dated. It was probably painted in Boston or Dorchester, Massachusetts. The artist doesn't seem to have had much knowledge of anatomy. Elizabeth's proper left arm, which means her left arm, not the one on our left. I'm talking about this here. It looks like a cylinder. There's no indication of bones and muscles. Her right arm and hand are virtually flat, and the neck reminds me of that tineal illustration for Alice in Wonderland after she's eaten the cake and is getting larger and her neck is all stretched out. Just to give you a sense of where we are in Europe, in the same decade, Vermeer was working and Rembrandt and Halls. This rather ornate chair was inexpensive for the time because its uprights and supports were turned on a lathe, a machine. Only the rail at the top and the arms and the clawed feet were hand-carved, which made it less expensive to produce. This blog post includes two pieces of furniture to make the point that American craftsmen could be quite skilled. So why are people like the makers of this chair so much more accomplished than painters or sculptors? I think the answer is that if you're a competent woodworker, you can observe a master's work and imitate it pretty closely. But if you're a painter or a sculptor, you need a unique point of view and you need some technical skill. Otherwise, egregious errors in anatomy, perspective, and so on will creep in to distract your viewers. To acquire the basic skills that innovators in painting and sculpture devised over several millennia, an artist either needs training by another professional or he needs a multitude of examples to study. In the early United States, few large private collections existed and there were even fewer museums that were open to the public. American painters and sculptors had no way to learn their craft well until they began to study in Europe in the late 18th century. This portrait dates to around 1741 to 1747. Robert Feek, who lived from around 1707 until around 1752, was an itinerant artist traveling throughout New England to paint portraits of those who were wealthy enough to afford such luxuries. Gershom Flagg was an art architect, builder, and landowner based in Boston. These portraits of Flagg and his wife are certainly infinitely more accomplished than the 1664 portrait of Elizabeth Eggington at the beginning of this post. And unless you looked at Feek's other portraits of women, I've given you two here, you wouldn't realize how formulaic Feek's work is. The women have the same pose, similar facial shapes and hairstyles, similar dresses. Possibly Feek lacked imagination, but I'm guessing that he was resorting to a formula so that he could paint more quickly and thereby paint enough portraits to earn his living by his art. And here's quite a jump circa 1778. This, on the left, is a portrait of a unique individual, from the shape and the texture of her face and hair down to the task that she's performing with her hands. 
and they're quite distinctive hands. They belong to an elderly woman, but they're still capable of working an intricate lace pattern. They add to our knowledge of her character, as do the hair, the bonnet, the chair, the dress, even the posture. John Singleton Copley, the artist, lived from 1738 to 1815. He grew up in Boston, whose wealthy citizens did own some art, and he spent several of his formative years with a stepfather who was a painter and engraver. By age 14, Copley was painting portraits on his own. In the 1760s and early 1770s, he created such notable works as Paul Revere and Boy with a Flying Squirrel, which I've given you in the center here. In 1774, as the situation in the American colonies became increasingly tense, Copley moved to London, where he studied British portraiture. His later portraits include this one of Mrs. Fort and one of his stepniece, Abigail Bromfield Rogers, who's on the right. It's a pretty wild outfit. John Trumbull, Connecticut native, trained in London with Benjamin West, an American who studied in Europe and then settled down in England. There, West became a famous painter of portraits and historical scenes. Trumbull eventually became famous for his representations of Revolutionary War scenes and figures, including the surrender of War Lord Cornwallis, which is on the right here. Like Copley, Trumbull makes every detail of his portrait of the Wadsworths contribute to our knowledge of the sitters, especially the way Daniel leans on his father to suggest the close tie between the two of them. Daniel later married Trumbull's niece, and in 1842 it was Daniel who founded the Wadsworth Athenaeum. This one is about 10 years later. It's by Gilbert Stewart, 1755 to 1828, who was a native of Rhode Island. He studied with a New England portrait painter, and then, like Copley, he fled to England during the Revolutionary War. There he too studied with Benjamin West. Seward is best known for painting scores of portraits of George Washington, including the one used on the one dollar bill, which is on the right. In the Wadsworth's portrait of a Revolutionary War general, the waist-length pose in three-quarter view is similar to the one used for Elizabeth Eggington, but what a difference in the way Stuart renders anatomy and light and shade and color and the background and especially the way he suggests the sitter's personality. This is from more or less the same time. During the early years of the Revolutionary War, Ralph Earle, 1751 to 1801, painted four pictures that were engraved by Amos Doolittle and used for pro-American propaganda. Earle also painted portraits such as Roger Sherman, who signed the Declaration of Independence. But in 1778, Earl declared that he was a loyalist, and like Copley and Stuart, he fled to England. There he too studied with Benjamin West, and became an accomplished portraitist in the latest aristocratic British style. Returning to America after the war ended, Earl found there wasn't much of a market for aristocratic portraits. In 1786, he was imprisoned in New York for failing to repay a small loan. Alexander Hamilton, and other members of the Society for the Relief of Distressed Debtors encouraged Earl to earn money to pay off his debt by painting portraits of the Society's friends and family. Among them was Earl's most famous work, a portrait of Elizabeth Schuyler Hamilton, upper right. After Earl was released from jail in 1788, he adapted his style to suit the Republican tastes of his New England sitters, painting them for another two decades. Like Robert Feek, Earl developed a formula for his portraits, which are often strongly reminiscent of each other. This portrait of Benjamin Judah on the left is close kin to a 1789 portrait in the Metropolitan Museum, and it's not that far off from the double portrait of the Ellsworths by Earl that is also in the Wadsworth. One more piece of furniture. By the late 18th century, sideboards were a popular feature of American dining rooms. They allowed one to display high-end silver glass and ceramics without actually pulling it out of the cupboard saying, look, look. Aaron Chapin, 1753 to 1838, whose shop was in Hartford, created this elegant piece from mahogany, satin wood, holly, ebony, and brass. Its simple lines make it neoclassical in style as opposed, for example, to the very elaborate decoration found on Louis XV furniture. If you did not know the date of the sculpture on the left, you might guess that it was created in the same period as the portrait of Elizabeth Eggington, 1664. 
that is a memorial to Sarah Reliance Ayer and Anne Augusta Ayer, ages 3 and 1, who died in 1849. Asa Ames, 1824-51, a self-trained artist, worked in northern New York State. In Europe during this period, Barry was creating complex animal sculptures and Thorvaldsen was doing neoclassical sculptures. And the last piece we'll look at today to bring matters full circle. By the beginning of the 20th century, the colonial era, including cooking over open hearths, as the woman in this painting is doing, was so long ago that it started to have a nostalgic appeal. Enoch Wood Perry, 1831 to 1915, specialized in representations of colonial times. No American painter of the colonial period would have been able to depict an interior with such accurate perspective or do the subtle play of light and shadow that appears in Perry's work. Next time we revisit the Wadsworth, we will be looking at some European paintings. DianeDurantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the free Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on DianeDurantyWriter.com. Thanks as always for listening.